Welcome everybody to the last webinar of this uh, spring and uh, exactly by Excel webinar number 71. And it's a pleasure for me to have here Sudarshan Beheira from the Max Planck Institute for Multidisciplinary Science in Göttingen. And he will speak about Bromax PME for an accurate estimation of the free energy difference. I'm Alessandra Villa, I'm hosting this uh, webinar together with Otto Anderson from the Finnish IT Center for Science. The webinar is recorded, that is just for your information. And during the webinar, you can use the Q&A function that you find at the end of the Zoom application, according to which operating system you have. You can have this symbol or you can see this symbol. Just type there the question. So we will see the question. And after the webinar, we will read the question. If you write us uh, no microphone, if you don't write no microphone, we will try to unmute you so you can ask directly to the speaker the question. After all the questions are done, we will activate if there is time the uh, raise hand. For any question about uh, a desire about webinar, you can always go to look at asbyexcel.eu and state your question. Something on the speaker of today, the today presenter. So Sudasham Heira is a postdoctoral researcher in uh, in Göttingen, and uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. In the computational biomolecular dynamics group at the Max Planck Institute for Multiplier Science in Göttingen, is in, involved in developing methods for identifying and tackling convergence issue in non-equilibrium alchemical free energy calculation as well as in the development of the PMX software that he will tell us about today. Now, before he, was, uh, he did his PhD in Bangalore, India, where he investigated the structure and the dynamics of different type of enzyme using molecular dynamic simulation and enhanced sampling methods. So I'm curious to see what he will tell us about PMX. So now I will stop sharing and keep you the chance to share your screen. Please go ahead. Okay, so shall we start? Hmm. Okay. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you, Alessandra, for your uh, kind introduction. And uh, welcome everyone once again to our BioExpo webinar on uh, accurate estimation of free energy differences using um, open source softwares, where we'll be seeing how you can use Gromax in combination with PMX to, to calculate uh, free energy differences across various systems. And uh, I'm Sudarshan Beharas, today's presenter. And in today's uh, webinar, I'll briefly introduce you to uh, molecular dynamics and alchemical free energy calculations so that all of us are on the same page and it will be easier for us to discuss the rest of the slides, followed by which I'll also talk a bit on PMX softwares and web servers, uh, applying which we'll then look into uh, three different test cases. And those test cases are uh, free energy change due to mutation, absolute protein binding free energy, relative protein binding free energy, and at the end, uh, we'll conclude the webinar and talk about what we are planning to develop in the future. Okay, so with that, let us uh, start and go uh, a bit deeper into MD setup. How do we visually run a MD simulation? We try to 
model the system as close to experiment as possible by taking the crystal structure of protein, taking the right salt concentration. If ligand pose is available, take the right ligand pose, then dissolve it in water, etc. Then bring the system into the interested thermodynamic state by using temperature and thermo uh, pressure coupling using thermostat and barostat. Then by applying an external force field, we uh, evolve the system using Newton's equation of motion. And from this Newton equation of motion, as you can see in this trajectory, which is nothing but uh, the evolution of this particular system from the initial state, you can calculate various interesting properties. And one of the most interesting properties that you can calculate using molecular dynamics is free energy. And why is free energy such an essential property to us? Why it is uh, so much important to the community? Let us uh, discuss a bit on that before moving further. And let us take the example of uh, ligand binding process. Free energy actually drives various physical and biochemical processes. You can understand many biochemical processes like uh, ligand binding using free energy surface. And uh, the free energy of binding, delta G binding, is nothing but the difference between uh, free energy of the bound state and the unbound state. And if you have knowledge about the overall free energy surface, then you can talk about the mechanism of ligand binding. If you have just the information about delta G of binding, then, then you can talk about how strongly a ligand binds to a protein. And if you know that, you can tune the ligand or the protein so that you have a better or a stronger binder. Similarly, for protein folding problem, say if you have information about the free energy change due to folding or the entire free energy surface, then you can talk about how to change the protein in a way that you can have more stable uh, protein at, it full, at its uh, folded state. So all these uh, uh, properties, all these phenomena, what it basically tells us is that free energy is a very essential property. And if you have knowledge about it, then you can do various things, including rational drug design, better protein engineering, and stuff like that. OK, so with that motivation of why we should study free energy, how to calculate it? How to calculate it using uh, molecular dynamic simulations? There are various ways, out of which I'm listing here uh, three major widely known methods. One of them is alchemical methods, such as free energy perturbation and thermodynamic integration, which are going to talk in future, in future slides. Also, you can use biasing techniques, such as uh, umbrella sampling, metadynamics, etc., or salvation methods like MMPBSA and MMGBSA. And in this method, our focus is mostly on or, or entirely on the alchemical methods. So let us discuss a bit more detail about alchemical methods go before going into results. And uh, let's talk about this particular interesting case where we want to study protein uh, ligand binding, say. And suppose you divide and devise an experiment, or suppose you devise a, um, a computational protocol to calculate the binding affinity or binding free energy of ligand A to this particular protein using molecular dynamics, how you can do is you can actually study the entire process of binding and unbinding. And say this is the free energy surface, then what you are interested in is to sample the entire free energy surface. And as you know, sampling such an entire free energy surface is computationally extremely costly because you have to spend a lot of time in crossing this particular barrier rather than just sampling the difference. Suppose you start from ligand unbound state, it is really difficult in simulation to see ligand unbinding because of this large barrier. But what we are actually interested in is just the difference between ligand unbound and bound state. We are not interested in sampling the entire free energy surface. And just add to this complexity, suppose we have another ligand, ligand B. And we want to know which of these two ligand, ligand A or ligand B, binds to the targets at a stronger uh, affinity. So that is calculating the relative binding free energy delta delta G. So for that, how we can do it computationally using a traditional method is calculate delta uh, G of binding for ligand A using very expensive computational method, then do the same for ligand B, and the calculate uh, then calculate the difference. Sorry. This is getting, uh, okay. Then calculate the difference using uh, uh, just the difference between these two. But calculating this, following this traditional method is very expensive as I have mentioned because you have to sample the entire free energy surface. Can we devise a way in which we can calculate the same property delta delta G at a much cheaper price? 
Yes, we can do that. So somehow we have the ability to change ligand A to ligand B in water itself through a unphysical alchemical states. Similarly, we have the ability to change ligand A to ligand B when it is bound to protein alchemically or in an unphysical way, in, in say very fast way, in a cheaper way. Then what we can do is since it is a cycle closer, you can calculate delta GB minus delta GA is same as delta GPL minus delta GL. So you can calculate the delta delta G to be just the difference between this and this instead of this and this. Okay, so now that we have understood the problem and we have a solution that we can calculate uh, the delta delta G using alchemical methods going through unphysical states. But how do one, how does one do it in, uh, in a practical application? There are many ways of doing that. One of the most popular ones uh, uh, is uh, equilibrium FEP, equilibrium free energy perturbation method, where both the ligand states are defined and coupled with a coupling parameter known as lambda. When lambda is equal to zero, you are in lambda A state, sorry, ligand A state. Suppose ligand A is methane. When lambda is equal to one, you are in ligand B, which is suppose you have methanol. So you want to go from methane to methanol. So in equilibrium FEP, what you do is you change the coupling parameter in a, in a discrete way. And at various lambda values, say lambda is equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 till 0 0.9, you run equilibrium MD in the range of nanosecond to microsecond. And then collect del G value at each and every lambda window. And some of them will give you the change in free energy due to the ligand mutation or going from methane to methane also. One more way of doing the same is uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamic integration in which you don't divide the entire uh, lambda space into various discrete lambda windows. Rather, you just run equilibrium MD only at lambda is equal to zero and lambda is equal to one state in the in say nanosecond to microsecond range. And then from lambda is equal to zero state, you start many non-equilibrium transitions in just picosecond range, say hundreds of picosecond. You run many, say you run hundreds of such non-equilibrium transitions starting from lambda is equal to zero to lambda is equal to one in a very fast non-equilibrium way. And those transitions are called forward transitions because you are going from zero to one. Similarly, you can start from lambda is equal to one state and go to zero and run many non-equilibrium transitions. And let us call that as reverse transitions. So you have 100 forward transitions and 100 uh, reverse transitions. Then from this non-equilibrium forward and reverse transition, you can collect the work values associated with them or the work done on the system. And then you plot the distribution of those work. And this is the distribution of this work look like, say, just in a typical schematic presentation. This is distribution of the forward uh, uh, transitions. This is the distribution of the reverse transition. And then what uh, Crookes fluctuation theorem states is that if you have such distribution, the point of interactions with well, the point of intersection between these two overlap is nothing but the change in free energy, nothing but the delta delta G. So that's how you can calculate uh, the change in free energy or the delta delta G using uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamic integration as well. And throughout this webinar, all the test cases that I'm going to present are based on non-equilibrium thermodynamic integration. Then the question that comes is why uh, non-equilibrium TI? Because as you might have already noticed that in non-equilibrium TI, we are focused only on sampling of the real physical states unlike in equilibrium where we sample unphysical state and spend a lot of time in unphysical states. Also, if you have the true end states available from experiments, say you want you are, uh, say the example of ligand binding energy to a protein, you need both the end states to be say holo state of protein and apostate of proteins, apostate of the protein. And if both the states are available experimentally, their crystal structures are available, then you can incorporate them, both of them, in our non-equilibrium uh, method because you are running equilibrium MD only at the lambda end states. But that thing you cannot do in equilibrium FEP. And if you do that, we'll see in future slides that uh, that leads to much uh, improved accuracy compared to uh, no, or not taking both the true end states. Similarly, since you have uh, hundreds of non-equilibrium short transitions, say 100 picosecond transitions, hundreds of them, you can, you can paralyze them in a better way compared to just having few intermediate lambda. 
Also, there are reports showing that non-equilibrium TI converge to the free energy estimate at a much uh, less computational time than equilibrium FEP. But also one has to be careful while doing non-equilibrium TI because uh, of the work overlap. In many cases, when you have um, a really large perturbation or when you are perturbing the say entire ligand, then what happens is the uh, work of the work forward work and the reverse work don't overlap. In such scenario, the delta delta G value that you calculate might not be correct. So we have to be careful when um, when um, doing non-equilibrium TI, especially looking into into the work overlap, um, work distribution overlap. And all these simulations, the equilibrium MD and non-equilibrium transitions, you can use uh, Gromax open source software, which is also part of uh, BioXL to do the simulations. Great. So if if all the simulations can be done using Gromax, then what is the problem? Why it, I mean, where the problems comes into picture? The problem is the system setup. Uh, it, it is not easy to set up the system, especially creating the structure and the topology for uh, for uh, alchemical transformation. Say we take the example of a ligand perturbation. A ligand we are calculating uh, delta delta G of changing a ligand where chlorine is in ortho position to meta position. Then in the PDB file or in the structure file, what we need is information about both the chlorine positions. Also in the topology file, what we need is information about both the ligand uh, parameters, ligand A parameter where chlorine is in ortho position and ligand B parameters where chlorine is in meta positions. And, and creating and manipulating this PDB and topology files manually or by writing a script by yourself to do it, how cumbersome it is, I think most of all, most of all of you know it if you have ever tweaked a topology or a PDB file for Gromax. But then add complexity of doing the same for a large number of ligands or large number of protein mutations or a large number of nucleic acid mutations. Then you th think about the complexity or the how error prone such a calculation would be if you do it by yourself manually. To resolve that particular problem, that's where uh, our tool PMX comes into picture, which was developed in the Groot lab. What it does is it creates the structure and topology files uh, in an in a automatic manner without much intervention from the uh, user and, and without uh, any error. So you can use this particular tool to study various, uh, various, various interesting uh, properties like what the authors, uh, what the uh, various reports from Bert de Groot has shown is that you can calculate it for, you, you can use PMX and Gromax for protein ligand binding free energy, protein nucleic acid binding free energy, thermostability change due to mutation and protein protein binding uh, free energy. And we are going to talk about a few of them in, in, in the future uh, slides. Also, from the same uh, group, there is a PMX web server which was uh, designed just uh, for um, generating hybrid structure and topology for amino acid mutation for free energy calculation. So I would suggest you to have a look into this particular uh, web server if you are interested in calculating um, free energy change due to protein mutation. Great. So with that introduction to MD, alchemical uh, methods and PMX software and web server, let us look into uh, the application of PMX and Gromax and uh, go into various uh, free, uh, various uh, test cases. So, so the first test case, we are going to look into protein mutations. And in this, I'm going to present a paper from the Groot Lab, which was published in 2016, where they study large scan mutation, large scan free energy state, uh, free energy calculations for uh, protein mutation. So let us try to understand the problem and why they, I mean, what they are trying to do and why they are trying to do. So let us again devise uh, an experiment or say computational tool or a computational method to uh, calculate the delta G of folding, like how much the, the free energy difference between the unfolded state and folded state we want to calculate for wild type. Also, when you mutate a particular residue of the protein, how much this delta G folding changes? So how would one calculate that? Say we start from the unfolded state of wild type protein and do a folding, folding experiment and calculate delta G folding for wild type. Then you do the same for the mutant and take the difference to be a delta delta G folding mutation. And that will give you how much free energy change happen 
for the protein thermostability or protein folding due to the change uh, due to the mutation but as you might have already noticed that uh, doing such a simulation or folding simulation for a, a relatively uh, you know larger peptide it is almost impossible uh, so is uh, experiment it is really uh, expensive so can you again devise a alchemical protocol to calculate this delta delta g of folding mutation at a cheaper rate yes you can do that what you can do is in the unfolded state itself you would change the mutation and calculate delta g of mutation in unfolded state similarly you can calculate delta g of mutation in the folded state and then take the difference which is same as that of uh, delta delta g folding mutation and this again you can do it using uh, gromax and pmx this alchemical uh, transformation and calculation great so now that we have understood uh, what they are planning to do what the authors are planning to do in this particular work then the question comes is why we want to do it i mean why it is essential for us to understand i think most of you know suppose you have the power to cal to know that what mutation has how much impact on the delta g of folding what mutation will give you a uh, stronger folded state or what mutation will give you a folded state which is more thermodynamically stable then you can actually engineer the protein to become more thermostable so that you can use it in a really harsh condition at an industrial setting way above 100 degree centigrade and if you have uh, and if you have the ability to go beyond 100 degree centigrade or at a higher uh, temperature you can always increase the catalytic activity of the enzyme because as you know rna equation um, uh, temp uh, enzyme activity is in uh, exponentially increases with temperature Similarly, with uh, having idea of how much folding free energy change due to uh, protein mutation or protein-protein uh, binding change due to protein mutation, you can engineer better protein-protein uh, interface, which are uh, uh, good uh, drug target as well. Okay, so now we have uh, the motivation also to study uh, such uh, processes. So let us look into the results of uh, this particular paper. What um, what uh, what they have come what what are the significant results in this particular work so the authors took uh, various protein in this work one of them is barnes where uh, they have mutated at 55 position 119 19 mutations they have done and for all these mutations experimental delta delta g value is available and as you can see here and the mutations here are uh, point uh, are marked as red uh, red residues and as you can see how the calculated delta delta g correlates well with experimental delta delta g most of you if most of them if you can see they fall in a nice uh, straight line with overall error absolute unsigned error is nothing but how much it deviates from experiment is well within one kilocalorie per mole just 3.8 clusial per mole and more than 60 percent of the data points falls within one kcal per mole which i think is a really remarkable achievement uh, pro uh, provided that we are using a cheaper alchemical method to get this uh, uh, delta delta g great so this is the overall uh, results but let us dig slightly deeper into it and look uh, on to some more uh, uh, more results of the same barnet system so in this particular work the authors have also used six different force field to calculate the same to get the same to compare across force fields and what they have found is charm performs better than uh, other force field but overall if you see all the force fields perform relatively similar to each other because if you see the overall error is around 4.5 clusial per mole between 4 and 5 clusial per mole for various uh, uh, force field on an average but what interesting to see is that the consensus approach when i say consensus approach when you combine the results from different force fields and take the average of the results it performs better than any particular individual force field approach so if you have charm results and amber results if you combine charm and amber results and the average result is better than uh, charm individual or amber individual results which is uh, something really uh, uh, something really fascinating to know so what we basically suggest or what the authors basically suggest here is if you are doing protein free energy uh, uh, protein free ener mutation free energy calculations then do it for do it do the same using multiple force fields and take the average result because that will give you a better accuracy with um, experiment 
Also, what the authors found is that when you have a charge conserving mutations, like say you are going from alanine to phenylalanine in the protein, then the uh, the error is uh, the error is much less compared to charge changing mutation. When you have charge changing mutation, like say you are going from alanine to aspartate, you have results uh, you have a error in the range of four to seven kilojoule per mole. But if you have charge conserving mutation, you have just within four point five kilojoule per mole. And this also makes sense because charge uh, changing mutations are uh, they are much larger perturbation because you are changing the charge and hence what uh, overall uh, it, it says is that uh, whenever you are uh, uh, trying to predict pre energy change due to charge changing mutation you should not expect as accurate as accuracy as charge conserving mutations okay so this was results from uh, the Barnett systems, but the authors also went ahead and uh, applied the method on various different uh, other protein system. One of the other protein systems is uh, is a SNAs where they have done 24 mutations again because experimental data is available for all these 20 mutations. And as you can see, the results is pretty very similar to what we saw in the previous slides compared to Barnett's, where uh, you have uh, the consensus approach performing better than single force field approach. Other than just uh, the um, uh, delta delta G calculated and comparing with experiment, they also compare for various protein systems, the calculated delta delta G with experimental available uh, delta TM. What is delta TM? It is change in melting, melting temperature due to mutation, which one would expect to correlate well with uh, delta delta G, that is free energy change due to uh, due to mutation. And as you can see, for various protein system, the calculated delta delta G correlates really nicely with delta TM with a correlation coefficient of 0 0.86. And what it suggests is that uh, this uh, particular approach of uh, using non-equilibrium alchemical methods using GROMAX and PMX provide you or predicts the delta delta G accurately for various uh, protein systems. Okay, so in summary, uh, the non-equilibrium alchemical methods performs as good as uh, experiments, but at a much cheaper uh, price. And uh, the authors also show that consensus approach or combination of various uh, force field approach performs better than a single force field approach. And charge conserving mutations are uh, easier to predict than charge changing mutations. And calculated delta delta G is shown to correlate well with uh, delta G TM, or uh, sorry, delta TM, that is change in melting temperature of the protein due to a mutation. Great, so that was uh, overall, uh, overall discussion on, uh, uh, on the test case one where we looked into change in protein uh, mut change in protein free energy due to a mutation now let us go into the second test case where we calculate free energy of absolute ligand binding when i say absolute protein ligand binding free energy what i mean is basically the binding free energy of ligand to a protein this is, this is not, nothing else okay and in this again uh, I'm going to present a work from D. Groot Lab, which was published in 2021 in Chemical Science. You can go and have a look into this paper. And uh, again, uh, the thermodynamic cycle, you have already looked into it, but uh, say we discuss again about it a bit, is that uh, we have seen how difficult it is to calculate this in a traditional computational approach. Rather, you can devise a uh, alchemical approach where you can uh, decouple the ligand in water as well as in the complex and calculate the delta G of binding to be delta G PL minus delta G L. But, but why would one, uh, one prefer to do such a calculation? Where are its application? Oh, there are lots of lots of application as we have uh, discussed initially, especially to understand how ligand binds to a protein and stuff like that. Other than that, the most interesting and uh, fascinating application is in uh, drug discovery. Say we are talking about a simple drug discovery pipeline where we first identify a target and validate it. When I say target, it's a protein, say. Then we look into, then we identify a, uh, a drug or identify a, a ligand which, uh, which binds to the target very strongly. That is known as ligand uh, lead identification. Then we change the functional group of the ligand and optimize it so that we get a better binder that is lead optimization and there were then various testing and finally approval. So the 
absolute binding free energy comes into play in the third stage of uh, drug discovery pipeline where we want to screen through various or say millions of billions of uh, ligands and trying to find out which one is best binder or what are those uh, few uh, ligands which binds to the protein at a stronger uh, affinity than others. In a traditional setting, docking score is usually used, which is really re less accurate. But if you have a highly accurate absolute binding free energy approach that I'm going to show in this uh, slide, how accurate our results are, then you can incorporate such a highly accurate absolute binding free energy in lead identification, and you can get a uh, much more accurate result. Great. So now we have a very good motivation to do absolute binding free energy. So let us look into uh, the overall performance of uh, of absolute binding free energy uh, protocol that we have devised using non-equilibrium alchemy, right? So here the authors again took uh, seven different uh, targets, seven different proteins like CDK2, CMET, galactin, and many others, and 128 ligand systems. And this is the overall uh, uh, delta G calculated versus delta G experiment plot. As you can see, again, it is really accurate. Most of them fall within uh, 1 kcal per mole, but the overall uh, results, uh, the error, absolute unsigned error is around 5 kilojoule per mole. But if you look into uh, individual cases like JNK1 or P38 alpha, you can see that the error is much less in this case, around 3 kilojoule per mole. Okay. But there are also cases like type 2 where the error is much larger, around 11 closure per mole. And why in type 2 especially the error is such high, around 11 closure per mole, whereas everywhere else it is just within 5 closure per mole? The authors speculate that it, it, it is because of the poor representation of the apostate. Because the crystal structure of the apostate of type 2 is not available in, 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 in from experiment in the literature, whereas it is available for all the rest uh, six target system. And we'll see how actually the EPO versus uh, the real EPO versus the modeled EPO affect the overall uh, performance or the overall accuracy of our uh, delta G calculations in the next slide. So this is the plot again. Say here we have, here we have uh, uh, X-ray, uh, where we have EPO state from X-ray available for six different targets except type two. And as you can see on the left plot, you model the apostate just by removing ligand from X-ray holostate. So that is not the real apostate, but just a modeled apostate. And you get error to be around uh, 7 closure per mole, which is relatively high. But if you take the true apostate into account and do the same calculations, both the true apostate and true holostate into account and calculate the uh, and do the same, what you get is the error within 5 kilojoule per mole, just 4.4 kilojoule per mole. And this significant improvements shows the uh, power of uh, taking apostate into account in our simulations, which non-equilibrium alchemy using Gromex and PMX provide, but you cannot do the same in equilibrium FEP. Of course you can do, but that will, be, that will come at a much uh, computational expense than uh, non-equilibrium um, alchemy. Again, if we look into individual cases, there is a significant improvement, especially in the case of P38 alpha, where you, you see if you just take modeled EPO, you have uh, you have the error around 11 closure per mole. But if you take the true EPO, the error is around 3 closure per mole. So there is an improvement of around 8 closure per mole, but just by taking the true EPO state into account if it is available from experiment. Yes, for P38 alpha, it is available. Then the authors thought maybe there is something uh, more interesting going on, especially only for P38 alpha, because such an improvement is not seen in other case. So they dig a slightly deeper, they dig much deeper into uh, this particular case, P38 alpha. And what they found is it is a single rotameric flip of a residue 309106, which leads to such an, uh, such an improvement in accuracy. So let us look into that particular result. So this is the hollow structure and the simulation, the T106 through nine residue is in one particular uh, rotameric state. And if you just remove the ligand from here and model the apostate, the error you get is around 11 closure per mole, which I have already shown earlier. But if you take the real apostate into account from available crystal structure and do the simulation, the 309106 is mostly in a different rotameric state than hollow structure. And that leads to an improvement of uh, to a great 
improvement and the and the error is just within three closure per mole. I don't know whether you are able to see it or not. I hope this should solve this. No. Okay. So what what okay. If you are not able to see the numbers, the error is three kilojoule per mole. So you see the improvement from 11 to three kilojoule per mole just by taking the true uh, posted into account, where the difference is only a rotameric state. Of course, there could be many other difference, but we don't know. But how would you confirm that this particular rotameric flip is the only issue or is the only contributing factor for such an improvement in the accuracy? For that, what the authors did is they took the hollow state and they changed nothing from the hollow state to construct or to model the apo state, except only changing the rotomeric uh, state of this particular uh, ligand, uh, this particular uh, residue and why it is not moving. Sorry, there is some problem with the slides. Okay. Let me share again. Okay. So we, we are seeing that how would you say that it is only the rotameric flip that contributes to sustain improved in the accuracy. So for that, what the author did is they took the hollow structure and removed the ligand and constructed the apo stru structure just like in the first case. But in this time, they just flipped the rotamer of T106. They did, they did change nothing other than just the rotameric state of T106. And what they found again, if you are not able to see the numbers, is the accuracy to be around 3 kJ per mole, which basically tells or concludes that it is this particular rotamer which contributes to uh, such an uh, improved in accuracy or a sampling problem if you are not taking the true posted into account. Okay, so in summary, again, non-equilibrium alchemy can uh, give you very accurate absolute binding free energy, which is very close to experimental measurement, but at much a, at a much cheaper uh, price. Also, if you have uh, the experimental structure of true hollow and apostate available from uh, from experiment, it is advised that you took you take both into account in your simulation so that you have a much improved accuracy, as we have seen in six different test cases, six different uh, target systems. And we also saw that a single rotameric flip can have a significant impact on the accuracy. So uh, it's better to sample uh, all possible rotameric flip of uh, near the active site. Right, so that was uh, the second test case. So let us move to our last and third test case where uh, we look into relative protein ligand binding free energy. When I say relative, what I mean is that we have two different ligands, a methane and methanol. We want to know which one binds the stronger. How much change in free energy of binding happens in going from methane to methanol, one ligand to other ligand. That is what I mean by saying relative binding free energy. Great. And here again, I'm presenting a paper from the same lab, D Groot lab, which was published in 2020 in um, chemical science. And here also the same, the thermodynamic cycle, we have discussed a lot of time in these slides. So I'm not going into detail again, but again, you can just construct one cycle closer and uh, the horizontal leg would be is equal to vertical legs and delta delta G can be calculated using delta G P L minus delta G L. And what are its application of relative, what, what are the applications of uh, relative binding free energy? There are many, but one of the most important, again, it comes in, uh, drug discovery pipeline and this we have seen that how absolute binding free energy if you have an accurate way of calculating leads to a uh, accurate identification of lead similarly relative binding free energy contributes in lead optimization where you have already a ligand and you want to know what kind of modification to the ligand leads to a better uh, binder or leads to a more stronger uh, ligand binding affinity. So in that case, you can use relative binding free energy. So in drug discovery pipeline, you can see that in, in between we have both absolute and relative binding free energy contributing. And with that uh, motivation, let us look into the results. So here the authors went and uh, uh, went for slightly larger uh, systems, slightly larger number of systems. 
they looked into 13 different targets, 13 different proteins, and 482 ligand A to ligand B conversions. Also, you can call them edges. So they looked for 482 edges. They calculate that they calculated uh, the delta delta G or the relative binding free energy using commercial software, uh, commercial software FEP plus also using Gromex and PMX. And when they used Gromex and PMX, they used GAF as well as season FF force fields for the ligand. And while using FEP plus, they used uh, OPLS3, which is uh, a golden standard for FEP plus. And as you can see, uh, if you look into slightly closer into the results, GAF performs slightly better with an error of 3.9 inclusion per mole compared to season FF. But the combination of these two results or the consensus approach, if you take the results and average them, it is better than the individual force fields. It is around 3.6 kilojoule per mole. And when you have the consensus approach, you see the results that or the error that you get is very close to that of you can get from uh, a commercial software. So what basically the authors are trying to say here is that you have open source softwares like Gromex and PMX. You can use them using various uh, force fields and the consensus approach will give you as accurate results as uh, a commercial software like FEP+. And consensus approach again here performs better than a single force field approach to be remembered. Okay. Again, on individual test cases, individual protein tar uh, target cases, you can see that uh, the performance is almost similar to the overall case where... Uh, where uh, uh, the consensus approach, the square uh, blue uh, points performs as very close to that of uh, the commercial FEP plus approach where you have uh, dark uh, maroon squares. And you, you can also notice that uh, from Gromex and PMX using non-equilibrium alchemy, we spend less computational time compared to that of uh, FEP plus. Great. And then the question comes is why the consensus approach performs better than a single force field approach, right? And so for that, we we'll look into one particular uh, target, CMET, and we we'll look into its data set of 25 inhibitor. And what you can see from here is that the results from CAF and CGNFF points in opposite direction to that of experiment, especially in those cases where it is marked as X. Say we look into this particular case. The yellow bar is from experiment and the blue bar, you can see it is, the result is more positive compared to yellow bar and season FF results are more negative compared to the yellow bar. And hence, if you take an average, it will be closer to that of experiment. And it happens in almost 14 out of, it happens in 14 out of 25 cases for CMET inhibitor data set. And hence, overall, there is an improvement in accuracy if you combine results from various force fields. And with that, uh, let me summarize uh, the results from uh, the third part or the third test case. And what we saw here is non-equilibrium alchemical methods using Gromex and PMX performs on par with commercial FEP plus on various protein ligand systems. And the overall accuracy with experiment is less than one kcal per mole, which is, which is really remarkable. And uh, we then looked into why consensus approach performs better because in some cases, GAF and season FF results points in opposite direction from the experiment. And hence, if you take an average, it performs close to that of uh, experiment. Great. So that's, that's where we uh, uh, conclude our uh, third test case as well. So let me uh, provide an overall conclusion and, uh, and, and summarize in one slide what all we looked into. First of all, what I'm trying to say you or what I'm trying to uh, convince you is that you can use uh, molecular dynamics open source softwares like Gromex and a open source uh, topology and structure building software uh, PMX developed by uh, DGroot Lab and calculate delta delta G or delta G free energy change due to mutation, ligand binding, nucleic acid binding and various other stuff. And the results you get is as as is very accurate to uh, experiments, and as accurate as possible to commercial software as possible by commercial softwares. And so, and uh, the evidence we saw in uh, three different test cases in this in this webinar, uh, especially in the protein mutation case, 
then uh, uh, absolute binding free energy and relative binding free energy cases. But there are many other uh, uh, test cases that are there on literature using PMX and Gromex. You can find it in uh, in uh, in D Groot, uh, Professor Bird D Groot's uh, um, Google Scholar, where they have shown the same working fine for protein-protein binding, then protein uh, nucleic acid binding free energy calculations. And you can find tutorials of all of all of these in uh, GitHub page of Professor Bert D. Groot. You go to GitHub, then go to D. Groot Lab and go to PMX. You can find many tutorials. Also, there is a website hosted by Max Planck Institute, pmx.mpibpc.mpg.de. And there itself, you can find many tutorials on how to do protein mutation free energy calculation as well as relative uh, binding free energy calculations. Nice. So with that, I am or what we are working on right now on future development of uh, PMX is one of them is uh, post translational modification. What I mean by that is we are now trying to uh, 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 devise a protocol where you can calculate free energy change due to methylation, acetylation or many other uh, uh, post translational modification to a protein. We are also working on to detect and resolve convergence problem. What I mean by that is, as I have mentioned initially, that if you don't have a overlap of the work distribution in some cases, it might lead to poor uh, prediction. And in some scenario, how would you detect such uh, issues and how would you resolve such issues? Such, uh, and those are the two things we are working on now. And say, so if you want to contribute or if you want to suggest us that what on uh, what other things that we can work on on how to prioritize, uh, prioritize our uh, development of PMX, I would suggest you to go to this PMX user survey, which will not take you more than two minutes just to click, 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 click. And it, it, is, it is there in BioXL website. You just go to BioXL and look for uh, user survey PMX. And if you have never used PMX, still you have listened to this particular webinar and know what actually PMX does, then still you can suggest us that how we can improve or what are the different things we can work on in future development of PMX. So I would request you to please go to BioXL and uh, do this user survey. With that, I would like to uh, thank uh, the PMX developer, Vitas, Daniel, Matteo, Sarvas, Yuri, Professor Bert D. Groot, as well as various funding agencies like BioXL, which uh, PMX is a part of, then Max Planck Institute, Janssen, and Boehringer for uh, all the support. And thank you all for your kind attention. And uh, I would be happy to take up um, any questions, suggestions, comments. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. There was a misunderstanding. So I'm sorry. I know that Bert was answering the question, but it was not the, what it was supposed. So I will try to see, because now for me, it's difficult to see the, the order of the people, but I will try to unmute the person in charge. Okay. So then uh, we will uh, try to answer to the question, because the idea is not that the chat is used like I was explaining the other time to answer. Okay. Yeah. So, Joshe, we will unmute Joshe so he can answer. He can, uh, if he's still online, we'll see. Mm, yeah, I, Joshe, you are allowed to speak now. If you want to ask directly your question, even if it was already answered, because not everybody see the answer. Okay, so if he cannot speak. So he had a question on slide 20. In some okay. case, show less accuracy in the Apple states why it might be happened. Oh, show lower accuracy. About... Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Showing lower accuracy in app, uh, by uh, taking exp explicitly the app posted into account in some cases, why is that happened? Why it has happened? That's the question, I guess. In the uh, if you look into galactin case, uh, I, 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 we think. I mean, what I think it might have happened. Uh, first of all, if you see, they are well within uh, the error bar, so they are not uh, differing much. But why the slight uh, um, uh, reduction in accuracy might have happened is uh, uh, because, say, maybe when you are starting from the true apostate. And uh, you be because before doing the non-equilibrium simulation, you do equilibrium MD. 
and uh, in the equilibrium md initial setup itself there because there are various for, suppose there are there is some issue with or slide issue with force fields that might might slowly accumulate on on the on the uh, on the uh, trajectory which might lead to say in some cases slight change in the conformation of the apostate and what you get at the end of an equilibrium simulation may not be the exact apostate that might have happened but overall if you see the uh, accuracy is comparable okay thank you we have another question from volodymyr i allowed you to speak if you want If it doesn't, uh, no, it doesn't react. So the question, have, I have a question about restraint. I okay. know the ligand is usually restrained in some way when computing BFES in order to avoid its free floating in the yes. decoupled states. Yes. Which approach do you use for restraining? Is it similar to equation and non-equilibrium and non-equilibrium free energy calculation yes so we use the same uh, very uh, standard and well known way of restraining the ligand that is used in equilibrium so in both the cases equilibrium as well as non equilibrium alchemy as of now use uh, the same similar approach to restrain the ligand which is known as uh, borish style restraint developed by borish and carplus where you restrain uh, six different degrees of freedom, freedom, which is uh, by taking three ligands, uh, three atoms from protein and three atoms from um, uh, ligand, and then uh, devise one distance and two angles and three different dihedrals, and restrain these different six degrees of freedom. And if you restrain these six, six uh, degrees of freedom, there is an analytical solution that how much this restraint would contribute to the free energy uh, value. And you can subtract that particular contribution at the end. So yes, both the equilibrium and non-equilibrium methods use the same um, um, uh, Borish style restraint. Okay, thank you. Now we have a question for, from Anali. I allowed him to talk if he wants. No, it's not reacting. So slide 19, I understand why the comparison from for uh, TYK2 with experiment is poor, but why with the PDE2 also has a large error as compared with to the others? Okay, so again, uh... Figuring out exactly what contributes to the error in free energy calculations is not a uh, trivial task. There are many things that contributes, like say you your sampling issue, that how long you have run the uh, simulations, then um, then how accurate your force fields are, then uh, when you do non-equilibrium transitions because these are absolute binding free energy, you have larger perturbation because you are uh, decoupling a ligand having thirty to forty atoms. So when you have such a larger perturbation, you usually have uh, poor convergence. So the work uh, doesn't overlap uh, properly. The work of forward and reverse tra uh, uh, transitions don't, don't uh, overlap properly. So it could be because of all these various factors. So pinpointing exactly one uh, particular reason what uh, that contributes to PDE2, I'm not sure, but it might be because of combination of all these uh, things like poor convergence, then poor sampling in equilibrium run, and then um, force field errors. Okay, thank you. Now we have Pallav. I don't know if he will, will we want to speak? No, I think it doesn't. Oh yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi Sudarshan. Hello. Yeah, I wanted to ask like, uh... <clears throat> Have you ever given th a thought about using uh, replica exchange solute tempering along with alchemical transformations in your, like, about implementing this approach in PMX? Like, I have seen many papers where they use replica exchange along with alchemical transformations to, like, enhance the sampling and get a better result. Like, in case of, like, uh, charge transformations in ligands, I am having a particular problems with convergence. Like, the calculations are very difficult to converge. Yeah. So uh, when you say uh, taking replica exchange also or incorporating replica exchange also into account in the transformation itself, 
Then if you are talking about the non-equilibrium non transitions, then we still do not have an idea how to do is because you see the non-equilibrium transitions that we do are on the order of 80 picoseconds or so. So um, having a replica exchange within 80 picosecond is almost, uh, you know, it is tough. And if you want to increase the transition time and do the replica exchange, then uh, it, it leads to a really uh, large, it becomes really expensive. But, but what one can do is indeed do replica exchange in the equilibrium itself or generate the equilibrium trajectory using replica exchange and then do the transitions from um, uh, those replica exchange equilibrium trajectory and just do uh, 80 picosecond transitions and that might lead to a better improvement, which of course we have thought about, but we haven't uh, worked on that directions or at least the uh, basic uh, preliminary results on some systems showed that, or at least in some systems we have, uh, or at least from our lab, people have shown seen that it doesn't improve much the accuracy when you do um, replica exchange in equilibrium MD, but we haven't done a systematic study yet, but that is still there in our mind. But if you see, as you have mentioned that there are various reports where people do alchemical transformation with replica exchange, though those are done in equilibrium FAP because you have various lambda windows and you run tens of nanosecond in the various lambda windows, then you can, you have enough time to do, do the replica exchange across various lambda values. But here our transitions are just 80 picoseconds. So there is no scope of incorporating replica exchange in the transition, uh, non-equilibrium transition itself. But okay. yeah, uh, but I, I would suggest you, maybe you can, for your case, uh, have a try, have, give a try on replica exchange on for generating the equilibrium ensemble itself and see if it improves the accuracy. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. Or, or maybe you can also uh, run the transitions longer, which of course you know that it, it might also leads to an uh, improve, improved accuracy. Or if you want to work more deeply into the problem, what you can do is actually find out where uh, the, uh, the convergence problem comes from. Like, is it when you do a large uh, change in perturb a large perturbation going, uh, going for charge mutation, is there some problem around the mutation site? Say hydration is not proper or is there a sudden conformational change that might lead to such um, convergence issue? and then trying to solve the problem. But these are uh, various thoughts which might be very involved, but these are the things that you can try, I guess. Thank you. Now I take the last question from somewhere in the cross Stefano. You can speak if you want. No, it doesn't react. So one of his question, I have he has multiple question. Uh, he was to know about the effect of using alpha fold structure to model the apple states of ABFE. Okay. Yes. And so, so uh, if you are asking the, the uh, my thoughts on that. Yes, if you don't have an um, uh, uh, experimental crystal structure, then for a comparison sake, I think you can do it to take uh, the uh, alpha fold depot structure. But do we have a proof that that uh, gives accurate results from using non-equilibrium alchemy? I don't think so. But using equilibrium uh, alchemy, I think there are reports. I remember reading uh, some papers which show that you can model the system using alpha fold and it also gives pretty accurate result, a pretty accurate uh, results like comparable to experiment. So I guess, uh, I guess one can give it a try in non-equilibrium alchemy itself and see how it works. But indeed, uh, there are reports showing that um, uh, it does uh, perform good. You say that you would like to know what the extent, at what extent we can account for difference between the two edge of RBFE. That was his question. I mean, Sorry. how many uh, atoms of difference we can have between the two ligands? We can have between the two ligands. Okay. 
so yeah okay so that is that is uh, one of the advantages of non equilibrium alchemy that if you have a larger difference even 20 atoms 30 atoms 40 atoms since you are doing uh, the transformation in both the direction forward as well as backward direction and you have uh, you have uh, uh, distribution of work from the forward as well as reverse direction so the free energy is always somewhere in between this two distribution and we have shown that in uh, rbfe case that i'm showing here in this particular slide here uh, the change in uh, uh, change in number of atoms is really huge even it goes up to 30 and 40 atoms but still we have results pretty close to experiment overall within uh, 5 kilo joule per mole so in rbfe case also you can have uh, a large number of atom perturbation but you will have a problem with the convergence so with what uncertainty you can predict uh, the value is, is the uncertainty of the prediction would be really really high but the mean value would still be as per our experience from abfe uh, would be pretty close to experiment but uh, 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 other issues uh, other issues to take into account is when you have such a larger perturbation and you are still doing the same approach for rbfe calculation you are assuming that both the ligands bind to the protein with the same ligand pose and same protein conformation which may not be the case so that might have an effect on uh, on overall uh, calcul uh, accuracy of the calculation but directly to answer your question to, to, to what extent you can have perturbation i would say up to uh, 30 uh, to 40 atoms but uh, it will have a lower convergence but still pretty uh, accurate uh, calculated values as per our experience okay thank you very much Shudan. so i close this section i wish everybody a nice summer break and we will come back at the end of august begin september with uh, a presentation from AstraZeneca about uh, application on EI. And now I say, I thank you all the attendees for being here as Sudashana to, for the talk. Thank you. I close this webinar section. Thank you, everyone.